Great, perfect. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar. Uh, as I always do in every webinar, in the chat, can you type if you are joining us for the very first time? I want to see how many. I, I see uh, familiar faces out there, familiar names out there. But I would like to see if you are joining it for the very first time. Very nice. Great. Wonderful, wonderful. Sandeep, Vitali, Suraj, wonderful. Anybody from outside India, uh, except Mike, obviously Mike is from US. Anybody from outside India dialing in? Houston, wonderful. Very nice. Great, so I will not waste much of your time. Great, Sophia, wonderful. Uh, so I will quickly introduce you about the Elite CISO platform. And then I will transfer it over to Anuj for further proceedings. So uh, welcome, guys. I'm sure you are seeing my screen. And uh, Elite CISO is a community that we build. It's a collaboration platform, which is for CISOs and by CISOs. As I always say, we are practicing CISOs from the industry who have started this initiative for industry collaboration. And with the two prime objective in mind, the primary objectives were driving collaboration and sharing knowledge, right? Those were the two things which we, uh, which we had in mind while we started this Fine. whole initiative and how we share knowledge. We do multiple things. If you go to the website, Fine. you will see that we record these weekly podcasts where wow. we invite CISOs, the practicing CISOs from industry. And we talk about different subjects, whether it is security awareness or threat hunting or uh, cloud security, insurance. So there are multiple topics that we talk about from the practitioners. And we share that knowledge uh, on, our, on our website, on our YouTube channel. Apart from that, we do highly discounted trainings, right? Because we see that the, the, the formal trainings are very expensive in the industry. If you go for ISO training, it's like 30,000 bucks and all, and CISSP even more than that. So we try to bring discounted highly uh, customized training for our members. So ISO training is like 2000 rupees. Uh, this already started uh, from 25th July. And the other training which we are bringing is on CISSP, which is starting from 8th of August. It is again highly discounted for members. So if you are interested, uh, you can go ahead and register for this training. And apart from that, we do multiple events like the webinar you are attending today. We try to bring industry experts from around the world and we conduct uh, webinars on different topics. Lately, we have been talking about zero trust uh, because with the overall work from home situation, a lot of people are uh, you know, uh, trying to find ways around how to ensure security while employees are working from home and how to do away with the traditional VPN. So on zero trust, we have done a lot of webinars. All the recordings are available on the site so you can go ahead and attend those. And then from the upcoming webinars perspective, if you go to the site, you will see that we publish our upcoming webinar. So this is the webinar you are attending today. And next week, we have another fantastic uh, webinar with Checkpoint where we will talk about how do you prepare yourself in a post uh, pandemic situation, what all needs to be done. And you can go ahead and register yourself over here. And apart from it, once you are attending this webinar, uh, you can claim your CPE certificate. So we have seen that a lot of people want to get CPE certificate for their CISSP and CISA uh, kind of uh, certification. So you can simply click on this CPE certificate link over here and it will take you to a form. And on that form, all you have to do is put your email ID, enter your full name and the secret I will share during the webinar, uh, most probably end of the webinar you have to enter that secret. And once you enter, you will get a certificate like this over your email. So this certificate you can use for your CP uh, points. And um, yeah, and apart from it, as, as we mentioned that uh, yeah. we, will, we will give away one Amazon Alexa. So all the participants who registered their name is in this uh, uh, wheel of fortune as we call it. So end of the session, we will spin it and one random winner will get Amazon Alexa, right? So that's how it is. And coming back to the today's webinar, it is, it is on a blockchain based passwordless authentication called block ID from one cosmos, because we have seen 
in the industry passwords are becoming a huge issue because you are maintaining multiple passwords and even if you have multiple controls available from security perspective and if the password leak happens hackers can simply do a vpn in your environment they can log on to your owa on your admin consoles and it's a nightmare to manage password so keeping that in mind um uh, we we partnered with one cosmos and hitachi and we are trying to bring a latest knowledge around password less authentication so that's what the theme of today's webinar is uh, having said that i will pass it on to anuj who will drive the webinar forward over to you anuj thanks uh, good evening everyone you know it's a pleasure to be here but it's just sad that you know i'm i'm seeing about 160 170 participants and this would have been actually a face to face thing where we could have all been together in a five star hotel had that chit chat conversation before and then got on to it but unfortunately this is the new normal so uh, i'll quickly uh, tell you what we are doing today so as as you know most of you all know we are hitachi systems i think a lot of names that i see here we worked with you in the past or we you know continue to work with you as we go right we are a company which was formed in 1991 we are today at about 1500 crores of revenue we are an end to end system integrator so what our usp is that we say we are cable to cloud right so we can deliver right from basic laptop desktop to server storage a lot of emphasis on security managed services you know not socks offering all of that that we do these are all the services and solutions that we offer and it's all back with the services that we have some of the vendors that we carry again these are all leading vendors so there's always this this you know question mark a lot of people ask that we are hitachi and are we only selling hitachi storage or hitachi products no we are a, we are a system integrator and we sell we sell integrate end to end most of the leading brands across the world right and uh, what are we doing here with one cosmos so it's our endeavor it's been in the last 3 uh, to 4 years we've always tried to ensure that we get best of security products into the country and we ensure that we back it up with our technical capabilities our sales capabilities and to offer this to platform to customers like you and as you know sometime back vikas mentioned zero trust we're talking about identity management we're talking about identity threats you know most of the cyber frauds if you have been following in the last 4 5 months is all about how passwords have got compromised how the two factor has become weak <laughs> and you know identity is becoming more and more important and as the backs were being compromised so the entire solution that we are offering is something around that and i would not want to steal the thunder from mike because he's actually been working on this presentation for a while so he'll probably cover this in depth so as again it's a four month old association we signed up with them in march and already we have about 65 active engagements seven customers are getting on boarded as we talk right uh, just some of our customers again we we you know cater around all the domains of business government bfsi psu manufacturing it its retail what the slide shows actually is because as a system integrator we are cutting across different business verticals and we are cutting across different businesses we today really understand what the challenge is and the challenge believe me is very different in different different business lines business lines which are b2c have a very different challenge today a b2b has a very different challenge with the post covid scenario what we are talking about unlock 3 how unlock 3 is going to happen how people will come back to offices how things are going to really change in terms of the way we work and here we are as a technologies provider or a solution provider to really help you navigate this journey help you be be partners with you to ensure that you are able to get back to work get back to business and you know in today's conversation as we say now no longer technology is a facilitator it's an enabler it's not an enabler i'm saying it's a facilitator it's become the core of businesses and businesses which actually invested in technology before or who were on that envelope of investing have actually been on their feet much faster than people who did so this is where we are and uh, pan india present so i see a lot of people across india who are this thing we have all our offices across india we are present in dubai we on uh, first of april we actually acquired a company in singapore so now we are present in singapore to cater to the apac market right so with this i would like to you know i just thought i'll keep it brief we have another 45 minutes i know we don't like to spent too much time on webinars so i was a little quick and fast but with this i would like to introduce mike with us here so mike uh, if you can put your camera on and i can see you yep just need somebody the host to press a button for me yeah, host can you get go. mike's camera on got it awesome so we here we have mike mike who is mike ingle he is 
from the East Coast, and he's the Chief Strategy Officer with uh, One Cosmos. Mike, before we get into your introduction or anything, let's just do a little icebreaker. Tell me, what have you been doing in the last four months of lockdown, and which one habit would you want to carry forward? <laughs> Well, I don't know about carrying forward, but I'll tell you, I've, uh, I've developed some very specific skills. I've been uh, working from home for many years, but not quite like uh, it's been since March when we all went into lockdown. Um, I live with uh, a big extended family, grandparents, grandkids, kids, dogs, cats. I have nine people and three animals and a goldfish in my house. So uh, my very specific skill is working from home where nobody can find me. Um, so I have places that I hide, uh, and you know, it's, it's been, it's been quite a challenge <clears throat> and I'll just, uh, set the stage in now for the next 45 minutes. There is a good chance that somebody will hear a, a baby crying, a dog barking, a wife screaming. It just, it could happen. So it's all part of the ambiance. Uh, <laughs> but I'd say my, my very specific skill is, uh, is, is hiding, uh, just so I can get work done. And I'm sure everybody can relate because it's, uh, this new normal has been kind of crazy. Yeah, it's the new normal, you know. So for ambience, we have the cats and dogs and, and the household members. <laughs> Earlier, it would be a nice, good-looking MC who would come for ambience, right? Things have changed. That's, That's right. the new normal. Right, That's so tell right. me, Mike, what is the one quote which resonates with you? Or which is the one quote which is your favorite? Yeah, there is one. Um, I, I, it's from James Cameron. <clears throat> Everybody knows he's a very famous movie producer and even Sea Explorer. Uh, done some great things in his life. And this really resonated with, with me when I heard it. And it's relating to the balance between risk aversion and risk taking. And you have to balance the two, right? It's what we all do, especially as cybersecurity practitioners. How do you let people in in a safe way that doesn't uh, let bad guys in as well? But he said very specifically that luck is not a factor. Hope is not a strategy and fear is not an option. And very specifically on that hope is not a strategy, I'm going to be uh, introducing a new term that I think everybody here will relate with that ties back to that quote uh, very, very intimately. So over to you, Mike, go ahead and introduce that term. And then I think post this, we can have a chit chat again. That sounds great. Okay, my screen is up. I need to stop sharing and uh, yeah, yeah, you are Mike. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> and this is my first conversation of the day. I may have to uh, get my voice going a few times. So. Um, okay. So yeah, the title of this here, as you can see, is a journey from what we call hope-based authentication to identity-based authentication. And um, my next slide is going to talk very specifically about this hope-based authentication, or we're calling HBA, right? Everything in cybersecurity needs a, a good three-letter acronym, or maybe four-letter. And uh, you know, despite us all having worked in identity for you know, for me, it's been 20, 25 years. Um, there's not much identity in identity-based authentication in your IAM platform, the I is missing. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, because we've been stuck with, as, as um, Vikas and, and Anuj brought up many times, the password problem. And it's not just a password problem, it's an identity problem. And what we're doing, when we ask our users to use the same as password, is we're asking them to authenticate with hope. So um, username plus password equals hope-based authentication. And very specifically, when you give a user a username and password to get into your system, you hope that first they can remember it, right? How many passwords have you forgotten? You hope that they've created a strong password. People share passwords. They use the same password everywhere. You hope that the password chains that you make them do every 75 days doesn't mess them up with all your complex security requirements and lock them out. And then because passwords aren't good enough, you hope that they can figure out your 2FA or MFA system. And then it gets better because you have to hope that the bad guys haven't stolen a central database and cracked the hashes. And then you have to hope that a man in the middle attack hasn't happened or somebody has socially engineered the password or otherwise fished it right out of their hands. So that's where, um, you know, coming back to that quote from James Cameron, very specifically, when it comes to authentication, we've been relying on hope as a strategy, hoping that the usernames and passwords don't suffer from all of these problems. So to mitigate it, what have we done as an industry? 
the cybersecurity industry has created billions of dollars of products and services. So this slide is one of those uh, logo vomit slides, right? That shows all the number of cybersecurity players in the identity space. And you guys know this well, there's so many vendors in the space that it's hard to know which way is up or down when you're talking to a vendor. And the reality is over 50% of these companies exist due to the insecurity of using usernames and passwords to guess who's coming into your systems. So I like to call a lot of these companies password mitigation companies, and they fall into a bunch of different categories that we're all familiar with. For example, you have, of course, the username and password itself. We've been dealing with that for 40 years. But since that's not good enough, we add uh, expiration and complex password requirements, hoping that the password gets a little bit better. And then we'll sprinkle on some 2FA, which includes email, SMS messages, one-time passwords, single token generators. And then 2FA might not be enough, so we'll add some MFA, right? More factors to 2FA. We'll do risk-based authentication. We'll do knowledge-based authentication. We'll add then single sign-on to make the passing of a token a little easier than the passing of a password. And then we have password managers, which have popped up, which put all of your big passwords around your little passwords, right? One big password. Passwordless solutions are now starting to get popular and they'll do things like exchange a pin or a key some of the time. And uh, everybody on this call should be familiar with FIDO. It is a great industry standard that has emerged. This allows you to put, um, replace a password with an encryption key on a specific device. And part of FIDO, you have WebAuthn, which uh, works with browsers and USB keys. And of course, over the past 10 plus years, we've introduced certain types of biometrics on top of a workstation. For example, fingerprint scanners, uh, face scanners from a camera, et cetera. But why? Just to help strengthen a username or password. So we all know that, you know, how bad the problem is, but uh, it's good to have a little bit of affirmation uh, and to know that this is a place where the bad guys are spending their time and effort. So rather than show you a whole bunch of headlines about how all these different systems have been hacked, there's plenty of them. I think there's one that comes out every day. I selected two key data points from the most recent Verizon data breach investigations report. If you haven't seen this report, you need to download it and share it with your peers. It is the global standard for hacking trends in the industry. It comes out every year. It collects data from 80 countries, millions of endpoints, and they analyze thousands of hacks that have happened. So one of the most important points in the report is about malware, which gets installed in your machines. Specifically, malware's main goal these days is to collect those, and they, they have this very uh, prominently in the report, they call them those sweet, sweet credentials. So this goal of password dumper taking the top spot amongst breach malware varieties is now at the top of the list. And the second data point from the Verizon report observes how the hacking falls into three categories. The categories are hacks that use stolen or brute force credentials, those that exploit vulnerabilities, and those that use backdoors. And the punchline here is over 80% of hacking breaches involve brute force or the use of lost or stolen credential. That's 80%. And you see people using this statistic all over the place. This is the report where that comes from. And it just validates that this is a place where CISOs and cybersecurity practitioners need to spend time to fix the problem. It's a well worth effort uh, to shore this stuff up. And so, you know, as, as I mentioned on my prior slide, um, we are introducing 2FA and MFA in the industry. We've been doing it for years. However, this is just a layer. It's not the answer to fixing the identity problem. And there have been some very high profile attacks recently how 2FA has been compromised, most notably. Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, had his credential and his 2FA stolen. Incredibly embarrassing and, of course, risky. And the FBI is also warning of the popularity of four types of 2FA theft attacks that are going on the rise. And you guys know how this stuff can be a man in the middle. So as you stated before, these 2FA layers are just other forms of hope, and they are exasperating your users, and they're expensive to maintain and purchase. So it's time to get rid of the credential, which closes this vector 100% of the time if you do it right. 
And I'm not talking about going password list. I'm talking about going credential list, getting rid of both the username and the password and the external MFA systems and migrating from, wait for it, HBA to IBA. All right, so you take that term, share it with your friends. So let's get back to what is identity. Again, there is no identity in most IAM systems. And so your real person is everything that makes you up, right? Your appearance, your demeanor, your language, what you do for a living, but your identity is how you prove yourself to others. In the physical world, it's established as you interact with society. So when you're born, you get a birth certificate. That is the first credential that you get. And then you migrate to student IDs, and then you'll migrate to driver's licenses, passports, and now you have some real credentials to identify yourself into the real world. My 11-year-old son has no way to identify himself other than a birth certificate, right? So you'll notice that there's no username or password involved in this form of, of authentication, and there's very little need for hope. When you walk into a bank or a customs checkpoint, you present your credential, it's trusted, it has security built into it, and you move about your business. And think about how this does not parallel the digital world in our IAM systems. If we relied on a username and a password and 2FA every time we got pulled over by a police officer for speeding, think about how much of a disaster that would be. So instead, we have real credentials that are given to us. So let's introduce the concept of real credentials in the digital world. There's a, a, a whole bunch of standards that exist around this that many people are just starting to get familiar with, but they've actually been around for a few years. So the to two areas where identity standards are getting very prominent and popular are identity proofing and identity usage. And you'll find that lots of companies are starting to use bits and pieces of this language in how they describe their products. For example, many MFA companies will say their product is NIST Authentication Assurance Level 2, AA2, AAL2, and I'm gonna talk about that standard specifically in a minute. So they're authenticating strongly, but they're not dealing with the identity component. So my point in all this is that there are key pieces in an identity strategy that exist out there and are standards-based and lets you know who is really at the other end of a digital connection. And we're not the only ones saying this, right? We didn't make this stuff up. So you're seeing this language come out of government RFPs and also the big boys like Microsoft and IBM have been all over a concept called decentralized identifiers that I'll be introducing here in a minute for a few years. And they're all trying to figure out how to work it into their IAM solutions, but they haven't tied it together in the way that we have. So here's two examples from the FIDO Alliance and Gartner, right? FIDO has become one of the most well-known technologies for using keys instead of passwords. Um, they don't introduce identity. I'll cover that right here in a minute. They basically turn your username and password into secrets that you store on a secure hardware device like a YubiKey. And this obviously has many benefits over a username and password, right? It's more secure, a uh, li little less friction. But then again, this authentication scheme does not actually identify the user. So in a recent paper this April, the FIDO Alliance started introducing the topic of identity in the identity and access management process, which is kind of ironic. And you can see here the three pillars of IAM, identi identification, authentication, and authorization. The FIDO covers the A here in the middle, and they prominently call that out, but not the full part of the EID scheme. And other organizations like Gartner are also acknowledging this as well. So this is a FIDO quote, that FIDO WebAuthn does not provide any details about how the user can be identified. And as I mentioned, Gartner is also using this language in a lot of their research and papers. They're saying the same thing. So in this recent paper, they acknowledge that <clears throat> this whole identity thing is actually pretty important. And those aren't their exact words. I might be paraphrasing a little bit. They stated that there is a growing trend toward orchestrating identity proofing. So let's take a look at how you take these standards and apply them to an IAM stack for both your workforce and your customers. And I know we're here to talk about password lists, and this is where this all comes into play. So when you tie identity together, your flow will look something like this. The first thing that you'll do is enroll an identity. And more specifically, you let someone enroll their own digital identity into an identity vault or safe via an app on their smartphone. 
So everything in an identity safe is highly encrypted and the user's private key stays in the secure enclave on their phone. This enrollment process that we do follows the NIST 863-3A standard for identity proofing. In Europe, there's a similar standard called EIDAS and almost every country follows these principles in some fashion and many of them come back and reference this NIST standard. So data storage in this model is done via W3C decentralized identifiers onto a private distributed ledger or blockchain backend. <clears throat> so as you all know, blockchain and distributed ledgers are immutable, they're highly secure. We've designed ours in a way to support rapid transaction execution. And again, this isn't a public blockchain, but uh, this can only be achieved with this type of technology for storage of data in a safe way. No data in what you're seeing and anything I'm showing you is enrolled in a central database. It stays with the user and under the user's control. So the second thing that an identity-based authentication system can do is allow the user to be authenticated across any number of user settings using identity tied back to their real biometrics. So in any situation where it's important, you can ascertain, is this person really who they claim to be? Not do they have a username, password, and MFA that matches something that was set up two years ago. So the use cases here are endless and I'll cover them in a minute, but it could be getting into a building, uh, going through an airport, logging into a website, logging into a Windows workstation, et cetera, with your identity and it's all contactless as well. So the third thing that we do is provide a requesting party with credentials. So um, this standard has, has, has gotten a lot of traction recently given um, the COVID situation and how people can have a COVID clear credential. I'll be touching on that as we wrap up towards the end. But the idea of a verifiable credential isn't just who this person is, but it's do they have a certain uh, attribute to them? For example, do they have a degree from a university or do they have in uh, Vicus's example, a certificate from the elite CISO uh, organization? And you can give this to somebody in a cryptographically secure and digitally signed way that does not require you to go back and ask the issuing authority if it's valid or not. And I'll show you an example of that, as I mentioned. And the point in all of this that is extremely important is everything that happens inside this type of architected system requires explicit user consent. The user's involved in the enrollment, the sign up, every time you authenticate or every time you verify a credential, the user must use consent because they have control of the private key. So this is a very critical design and operating feature. And it's also in line with um, all the evolving compliance requirements relating around PII, so your GDPRs, your CCPAs, et cetera. And the final point in all this is the reason why we are all here, right? It's to solve problems. So there's all kinds of corporate use cases for better access to physical and digital systems, uh, logging into logical resources. And there's also a whole bunch of consumer facing benefits in both a closed, excuse me, and a federated model um, to help facilitate authentication and give the user a better experience. So uh, we'll be getting into this here. So let's take a look at how this can be introduced into an organization like yours. So I'll show a few components and how they interact with each other so you can see how the moving parts come. So you'll start with the digital safe or wallet or mobile authenticator like I uh, mentioned on the prior slide. So this is the interface with the user and it's, it handles the biometrics, the key utilization and how you, the user interacts with a third party system for all the consent and credential uh, sharing that I mentioned. So the features in a modern smartphone are what are the real enabler here today. They enable the secure storage of the key into the enclave of the trusted store, as well as give you a very strong biometric that every smartphone user is already used to, right? Because of Apple and Google and Samsung, et cetera, users have gotten very comfortable with interfacing with their phone for a biometric capability. Next, an identity gateway facilitates the communication between the user and the system on the other side. And this is commonly called uh, an API gateway or an orchestrator. So if your passwordless identity system is designed properly, it should have no visibility into user data that's exchanged after enrollment. 
This is called a triple blind conversation. It's one of the key principles of these types of systems as well when they're designed properly. And with cloud being on everyone's mind, you need the option to run this as a service in your provider's cloud or in your own cloud infrastructure, or even on-prem. So it should be containerized, Kubernetes-based, et cetera, with those types of technologies. If the service does run in the cloud, you'll typically have a lightweight agent that goes in on-prem that's a proxy between the user and some internal systems. And of course, you should not need to put any type of box in a DMZ or open firewall ports for this type of uh, technology to be used. Uh, run away if you have somebody uh, asking you to do those types of things. Of course, at the end of the day, you're still sending some type of key or user data to a requesting system or person. So this data should be stored in a place where nobody, not even a sysadmin or, or uh, you know, a bad guy with the most evil of intent can get to it. And that's why blockchain is the perfect storage mechanism for identity related functions. In addition to storage, it also provides an immutable ledger of all the enrollment and the authentication activities. So this helps meet a lot of the banking and other industry requirements to make sure that you have a clear audit trail of everything that's happened in your system. And then of course the public private key design of blockchain always keeps the user in control of their data. I'll probably mention that 10 times as we move forward, but it's very important. Now, as the user authentication completes its journey, it will touch the target system. So internal systems will communicate with the identity gateway or that orchestrator via typically an existing proxy infrastructure, your blue coats or whatever, and very little infrastructure change should be needed to make this happen. Now, as you can see, the user's identity safe can communicate with the target system, for example, a Windows workstation or a web-based service. And I'll show you exactly how that happens with a live demonstration here. So uh, this is my final slide before I show you how this thing actually works. Um, I just wanna relate a couple of concepts to corporate identity. So by introducing standards-based proofing, that NIST 863.3 concept, you can establish citizen or corporate identity, right? So citizen identity is all your citizen-based government credentials, et cetera. Your corporate identity could be your AD or other uh, on-prem uh, services. So we all know that due to COVID-19, many new hires will never be coming into the office for the foreseeable future, right? They're just not gonna be exposed or wanna take that risk. So now using these technologies, you can proof them remotely the same way that your HR department used to do it in person. And there's no limit to the type of credential you can enroll. The same proofing concepts are also applied to your existing users. So as I mentioned before, your connections to Active Directory, your physical access control system, or uh, some uh, SSO gateway, et cetera, these credentials are all enrolled one time, and then you'll use user certificates going forward to replace the username and the password with identity. It's really common for an organization to start with like the low-hanging fruit such as Windows workstations or remote access, especially in today's remote world for things like VPN and Citrix. And since these are the most touched systems, you can have very measurable ROI in the first few months of a deployment. And you can measure it in the, in the form of time saved per user, right? It normally takes 22 seconds to log in and a lockout takes 10 minutes to reset. And you can also measure it in terms of fewer help desk calls. So we have a whole bunch of uh, net promoter score type concepts and real ROI that can be measured in the early days of this. So let's, uh, enough with the backstory, let's get you started with a enrollment into a password list system and then show you how actually use the identity to authenticate. All right, so what we're gonna see here is our friend getting invited to participate in the password list identification system. So we are emailing them into their corporate email, a QR code. This QR code is an invitation to install the app. This app could come from the standard app stores that are out there, or it could be an internally branded and pushed through an internal like MDM type app store through a mobile iron type environment. So the user will get taken to the app, install it, and then the instructions say, scan the QR, to QR code a second time with the app itself. And what this does is links the app back to the user's corporate instance of the application. So now they're bound. And what happened behind the scenes here is a decentralized identifier 
has been created and given to the user and his private keys being established on his phone stored in the Enclave. Now, we're gonna start introducing a bunch of credentials. We're gonna start with an Active Directory credential. This is the same way you would log into a VPN or, or Citrix. So we'll type in their current AD username and password. Now behind the scenes, what's happening is this AD username and password is being exchanged for a user certificate. And we actually are emulating a smart card with this process. That user will never need to use this AD username and password again. They will just rely on the smart card certificate. Okay, now let's introduce some other credentials. We're gonna start with what we call our live ID. This is a real biometric. So that handsome young man just enrolled his live ID into his identity safe. And that is not touch ID or face ID, right? Touch ID and face ID are great um, device biometrics, but they don't prove somebody's user. And I'm gonna show you how that handsome smiling young man is linked back to his real citizen identity in the subsequent stages. And that face that we just enrolled can be used for any type of high security operation going forward. All right, we are introducing a driver's license. So this is where we start introducing citizen credentials. So we're taking the data off the front uh, and the back, and we're also grabbing a copy of the picture to compare it to the user's live face. And I'm gonna run through three credentials in a similar fashion. We're gonna enroll the data from a passport into the user's identity safe. Again, capturing the data via OCR, grabbing the image, and we, on the passport, we also can scan this with a high degree of accuracy because we can scan the NFC chip that's built into the passport using the phone's NFC reader. And the key here for that is that NFC certificate is digitally signed by the issuing authority, so you can trust it. And it gives a very high res photo. So and I'll also point out that all of this data is being done in memory on the phone and scanned and the biographic information is being written to the user's private store. So none of this is ending up in a central database outside of the user's control. All right, the third credential we're scanning here is the Adhar card using the similar concept. And finally, we're gonna introduce the PAM card as well. Now, these are all options, right? Depending on the corporate profile or the application that we're trying to sign up for, these are just steps in a journey that you can have to strengthen somebody's identity via these uh, mechanisms. All right, so we've just enrolled citizen credentials, a corporate credential, we've linked them together, and we've triangulated that user's live face with the face that's on the documents, and we now have the equivalent of a physical credential that you would carry in your pocket and present it to somebody and it's in this person's control as much as that physical credential would be. So let's use that identity now to perform some passwordless authentications. So this is a Windows workstation and the user experience is typically brokered by the scanning of a QR code to initiate the handshake. And this is that triple blind conversation that I mentioned before. So instead of the username and password, the user now has the option to do passwordless login. They will scan the QR code with their mobile phone, provide their real biometrics on first login, 100% undeniable proof that this is the user, and they're in without touching the keyboard. Now on subsequent logins, let's say this user locks the workstation, they can um, receive a push message and use Touch ID, right? It's completely customizable on what level of friction that you wanna have. Uh, you don't need to use Live ID every time after the initial login. Now that the user has logged in, we are going to go to Okta and present their Okta username or uh, Okta credential, so we don't need to use an Okta username and password. And while Okta is a phenomenal single sign-on gateway, it still requires a username uh, and a password to get in, mostly when you're accessing it remotely, right? When it's not coming from within the corporate network. So here the user will enjoy the same experience using our IDP. They will scan the QR code, their token is given to Okta, and they're logged in without a username or password. Touch ID is presented in this example. 
And now they can go launch Slack or whatever other application is behind the Okta SSO portal. All right, so I'm sure you're seeing the benefits already and the wheels are turning in your mind, but let me focus on a handful of, of real be uh, uh, benefits behind the scenes as you move from what hope-based identity to identity-based authentication. So a couple of the immediate benefits are first, obviously you're getting rid of the username and password and all the problems uh, that we had around that. There's too many benefits to state here, uh, but the second benefit is continuous identity verification. Every time the user allows their identity data to be revealed, you have the option to check that real biometric. And we're not just talking about touch ID and face ID. So that brings me to the third benefit. You can always use the real biometrics to strongly reestablish their identity. And so we all know that people lose phones, they break, et cetera. And there is a uh, identity recovery mechanism based on another industry standard called BIP39 that allows you to reestablish this identity and relink it. And you also need to keep in mind that Touch ID and Face ID are very reliable. And of course, Android has all of its flavors that are very similar. But again, they're not identity. And what can happen is something that needs to, you need to check with your authentication providers is what is the protocol when a spouse or a child adds a fingerprint or an alternate appearance to their phone? You can no longer trust whose thumb or face is coming into the phone. So you need to go back to identity and reestablish using real biometrics. And if you have this types of standard-based system, you can do that. And I'll give you a real world example. I'm a Bank of America customer. My Bank of America app uses Face ID to let me log in automatically. If somebody else comes to my phone and puts their face on it, Bank of America app detects that. It does zero knowledge checks of the app and says, you know what, your face ID has changed. I don't trust it anymore. So they make me put my username and password back in, taking me back to where I was six months ago. Instead of doing that, using a biometrics-based blockchain system, I can just say, you know what, I need to see your real face again, and then I'm gonna let that face ID get reestablished and linked back to your Bank of America identity. So lastly, using the decentralized identifier, you don't have to rely on a central credential database and you have a safe place to store all the private keys and biometric and biographic information in a place where only the user can access it. So those are a couple enterprise use cases and I'll give a few more examples of those in a minute. But let me give you an example of how your customers can go passwordless without friction. All right, so this is um, an example of Chase Manhattan Bank, one of the largest banks here in the US. Uh, let me back this up a little bit. Okay, so um, this user, we call her Kate, and you'll see her all over our website. She has already established her identity with the bank, right? Every banking customer has already gone through KYC and get checked for anti-money laundering and all that. They have a very strong identity already. So you don't have to reproof them. You just need to link their existing identity into their um, block ID uh, identity safe. And of course, this could be private labeled for Chase or they could use our SDK and use any of the components. So what Kate's going to do here is type in her username and password. And with just four lines of JavaScript code, we can introduce the linkage of her identity to her safe. So she's being asked now, would you like to go passwordless? Of course, she's going to say yes. And the instructions then take her to say, in your phone, simply in your Chase app, simply scan the QR code. And this will now establish that basically FIDO2 authenticator to allow Kate to go passwordless in the future. We'll ask her for biometrics. And now she's giving a little message saying, you've been uh, upgraded to passwordless going forward. The second time she logs in, all she has to do is scan that QR code or she can get a push message if her, she's already been in there once before. She'll provide uh, biometrics again, and she's in without touching the keyboard. Now, Kate wants to go uh, obtain a mortgage. She's shopping for a new house. So this is demonstrating a principle called open banking, which I have a feeling you are all much more familiar with than I am. This has gotten a lot of traction overseas. For me, overseas is obviously out of the United States. And open banking, 
uh, is an electronic way for banks to share information with the user's permission. And if you think about the alternative, you have to, if, if you have data in one bank, you have to go to the second bank, download statements, email them, fax them or whatever. Open banking is designed to get rid of that manual and very insecure mechanism. So Kate is coming to a new mortgage lender where she does not have an account. She's going to use all of the data from her identity safe that was introduced via those uh, citizen credentials and apply with the press of a button. And then she's going to go get the checking data out of her uh, Chase checking account with the press of a button as well using open banking. So what this form says, it's a little hard to see on the Zoom, but click here to fill out the form manually or just use your password list authentication to fill out this form. And Kate will obviously scan the QR code. She's gonna present her live ID and gives consent for this mortgage lender to receive all of her biographic information that's needed to fill out the form automatically. Okay, now the final step in this process is income verification, as I mentioned. So Cosmos Bank needs to know where her checking account data is. She will come to this dropdown, pick the partner bank where her checking account is, and now we're doing a federated login to Chase Bank. Now what it says here, next to the Chase logo is that, hey, Cosmos Bank is asking for three months of deposit information to verify. Would you like to uh, uh, exchange this information with the requester? Kate will scan the QR code for authentication. Chase wants a biometric to make sure it really is her. She gives consent, can see exactly what data is being requested, three months of deposits, and the income has been verified and an application has taken minutes instead of potentially days. Right, so there's a real world customer example of how the technology can be leveraged. So um, just thinking about the user journey in a corporate setting, these are typical places where password list is getting a lot of traction. We already talked about the first point here, employee enrollment. I didn't touch on physical access, but once you have a credential in your phone, you can simply touch your phone to a, like an HID reader and exchange a credential instead of having to use a piece of plastic. Uh, and then I already demonstrated a Windows logon and some internal web resources like Okta. So um, I'll just show two more short examples, a Unix login and a password reset. And the reason I wanna show these to you is once you have identity, you can start to add different types of what we call user profiles into that identity. So a second type of profile could be a, uh, an administrative account, right? So it's very common for um, you to have an administrative account to get into ad, uh, privileged systems. So here, Kate's introducing her admin account. And again, we're exchanging this for a certificate. She'll never need to use it again. And then as she comes into uh, a Unix prompt, she'll see a QR code generated. This is via a PAM plugin on the workstation. She selects her admin profile, authenticates, and she just logged into an SSH session without having to touch the keyboard or a username, password, or SSH key being exchanged. All right. And now the final uh, example that I'll show in the corporate setting is legacy self-service password reset. All right. So it's still, you, you know, we're not uh, going to say that every password is going away day one. So you can see Kate banging on the keyboard on her legacy HR portal. So she'll come into her app, click on a password reset button, pick the profile in question that needs to have its legacy password reset, introduce her new password, introduce the live biometrics. And she just reset her password without having to call the help desk or use some type of cumbersome self-service portal. Right, so um, just a time check, uh, Anuj and, and, and Vikas, I have one more example um, just to uh, run through how a verifiable credential can be used in a COVID-19 scenario. Go so ahead, I got Mike. About, go yep, ahead, I got Mike, about go 60 ahead. more seconds and then we'll wrap it up. So that third pillar in an identity-based system is verifying somebody's credentials. And this involves credential issuers, such as the elite uh, CISO group, 
the user that's going to hold the credential and somebody who's verifying it downstream that can click on uh, a credential and verify it instead of it having to be a manual document. So we've been working with an organization called the COVID Credentials Group, covidcreds.com. And they have um, taken all of these standards that are out there and applied them to how you have a COVID verifiable credential in the form of an immunity test, you know, uh, either PCR, IgA, IgG, or a vaccination when that comes out. So rather than, again, carrying around a piece of paper, you'll be able to use this technology to digitally enroll, receive the credential, and present it to an employer, a travel agency, et cetera. So let's let this roll here. This is the interaction between Kate and a doctor who's issuing the credential. So they're going to test the citizen. The doctor creates a QR code, and now the uh, user is authenticating with the doctor. With user consent, they're saying, I would like to exchange a certificate with you. So we have the results. The doctor is authenticating as well, so we know the doctor did it. And now we're touching positive or negative here on the result. And the user's certificate on the ledger is enrolled. Stored on chain. And so now downstream, when somebody needs to consume that certificate, they can do it in that cryptographically way with zero knowledge proofs. So in other words, we don't have to go back and ask the doctor or the lab. We have a signed copy of that certificate that can be trusted by a third party. So we'll come in here to Marriott, click the COVID clear button, authenticate. The certificate is presented, decrypted and uh, presented off chain now and given to the, um, the requesting authority after Kate has given consent. You can also do this without consent. So things like a university degree can also be done and kind of have a permanent credential that's put out there, right? Same way as you would put your university degree on LinkedIn. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time and listening to the story. I hope it was helpful. Um, I think we'd like to get into a little bit of q and I saw a bunch of, uh, of chat popping up here. So uh, why don't we get into that, Anuj, and we can, uh, oh boy. Mike, I'm back. I don't <laughs> think that's Anuj, sorry. Uh, so why hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's your username, please? <laughs> I know my password, and I think everyone else knows your pass one, two, three. Exactly, exactly. No, thank you. <laughs> so hold this on, is let me send you. Yeah, exactly. Let me send you a text message and verify you. <laughs> okay, so guys, uh, I think we have uh, Rohan Pinto as well, the CTO for uh, One Cosmos here with us. Rohan, can you switch on your uh, video as well so that we can do the question and answer together? Sure, sure, Anuj. Excellent, Rohan. So uh, if, if you could do a quick introduction about yourself and then we can take the Q&A. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and good evening, depending on which time zone you are at. Uh, so I'm Rohan. I'm the CTO at One Cosmos. I've been in this crypto uh, uh, IAM space for over 20, 25 years and been working with Mike and the likes uh, for a very, very long time. So if you've come up with any questions that you have, I'll be more than happy to answer it. So Ro Rohan, the first question that has come to us is how easy is it to integrate into your existing setup? You know, because it's, it's a new way of doing uh, authentication and we're talking passwordless and something that we've not done over the years. Now, how easy or how difficult is it to integrate? And this is for both Mike and Rohan, both of you. Sure. So, I mean, with typical IAM solutions, right, I mean, implementation or integration takes sometimes from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Uh, but the way we have orchestrated the platform, which is a, a cloud-based service, it's a SaaS service, um, and integration with any existing IAM system, be it your Windows login or be it your Unix login within your enterprise or even physical access to your systems, and integration with web applications using standards like SAML or OIDC can all be done in a couple of hours, depending on the kind of data sources that one would need to tap into. So implementing a platform or solution like this within any organization uh, is a matter of, I would say, a day or two days effort at the max. All right. Now, how, you know, if I have the different MFA solutions already present in which most of the customers here have, you know, either we have a one-time password or we have, uh, you know, an RSA token or we have something which is already present, how do I replace them? 
uh, we wouldn't say you would want to have to replace it, right? I mean, it's very difficult for any organization to cut off from one and go to another altogether. So we typically deploy in a tandem approach, which means that you would give your users or your employees the choice of logging in the traditional way using MFA, which is probably a user ID and password and an RSA token, but also parallelly have the ability to just scan a QR code and log in or parallelly have the ability to log in using your live ID or biometrics from your device. And, we, and what we have seen, the pattern that we have seen uh, with most of our customers is that users tend to transition from one to the other over a period of time. So that makes it easier for people to also adopt and get used to a new technology or a platform rather than having a, a overnight cut over from one to the other. Excellent. Now the other thing, Rohan, which is extremely important is why is blockchain used here? Just because it's cool, just because you know people are talking about blockchain, is that what you've used blockchain here? Or it genuinely has a reason blockchain to be used here? Okay, so so the fundamental... But the PEs love it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, cool factor is one of the factors, right? But cool is not the reason we have the blockchain out here. What blockchain brings into the picture is the ability for your platform or for your system to inherently trust uh, the ecosystem at the core. For example, when you've got a digital transaction that has been logged onto the ledger, uh, you now have got an auditable trail from the time the user enters the building to the time the user logs onto his workstation or to that point in time the user performs some transaction within the organizational network. Today, there is absolutely no way for you or any organization to validate that the person who entered the building by scanning a badge at the door is the same person who actually, actually logged on to your Windows desktop or to your corporate workstation, who again actually is the same person who might have performed a transaction on some kind of a trading platform that you might have or, or some kind of a, 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 a ecosystem or your corporate assets. There is no traceability. So what blockchain brings to the picture is that inherent ability to trust at the core of the ecosystem that the person who entered the building is the exact same person who logged onto the Windows platform, who is exactly the same person who uh, uh, performed some transaction on the organizational network. Mike, for your views on this. Yeah, no, it's um, I, I, I am not nearly as much of a blockchain expert as Rohan, but I've, I've really come to appreciate it. And, and frankly, I saw this company a, a year before I joined and, and I thought the same thing, like, yeah, blockchain, everybody's talking blockchain. But when you apply blockchain to identity, it makes complete sense. There's no other place that I would want my biographic or biometric information stored. And I would love to have the audit trail, the immutable ledger of every transaction. If you think about what it takes to tie somebody's user together, identity together today, with Splunk and Log Logic and all these things trying to figure out who did what and when. Imagine if you had one immutable record to validate that stuff. It's like it really opens up a world of possibilities and saves a lot of time and effort. So I'm a believer. Excellent. Mike, you've been a CISO at a large bank uh, back in the US, right? And now you've moved into wearing different hats, right? You know, now that you are on the other side and you're looking at technology very differently, you know, what would you want to give as a message to the community at large? Because we may predominantly have CISOs here. And what would be the message in terms of identity, in terms of security, in terms of the next two years? How do you look at this whole space shaping up? Yeah, I think, um, I think getting back to the industry standards is key. You know, when I was building an IAM system in the 2000s, we, I was at Lehman Brothers and they had one of the, uh, the best systems on the street and, and, and most innovative, there were no standards, right? Uh, things like SAML didn't even exist back then. It was just Kerberos was your only option to pass a token around. Today, there are real standards and everybody is asking for them. Right? Your governments are asking for them. The big banks are asking for them. So let's, um, let's figure out how to work those standards into your system. If you stick with standards, you'll avoid vendor lock-in, right? I don't want to sell a solution to somebody that can only work one Cosmos and block ID. So um, I think we'll probably be sharing this presentation out. I would, I would recommend that everybody get very familiar with them, you know, set up the Google News Alert for the various identity standards that are out there and just stay in the loop because it's happening at a tremendous pace. And, you know, we all have to get our feet wet a little bit on this stuff. And applying standards-based identity into your organization doesn't have to be a heavy lift, right? There's ways to, as I mentioned, walk before you run. And we have, you know, 30-minute demonstrations of how you can enjoy the benefits very quickly um, and really uh, get a feel for it. So I would just say it's all about the standards. 
Sure, we have time for the la one last question, one and last I think that has come a yeah. couple of times. Yeah, so log integration with SIEM for privileged users, and how does blockchain tie into zero trust? Uh, absolutely. So, so our logging platforms. Uh, so the way we have architected the platform or the solution is to ensure that one does not have to go through the loops and holes of trying to discover how to integrate with a new platform or a new technology altogether. So we can tie into any existing uh, uh, analytics or log uh, log analysis tools, be it Elastic or Kibana or Splunk, uh, and and we tap right into it. So you have. Uh, uh, the analytics or you have the visualizations that the organization would require to find out or drill down into which action was performed by which user at any given point in time. Excellent. So I think it's bye-bye uh, back again from Dali. Right. Uh, thank you very much for everyone joining the show. And Vikas, it was a great, great effort for you to get us here and help us, you know, really rekindle this whole space of how you, you manage identity or you run identity, right? right? And, this is not Anuj talking, this is someone else. <laughs> great, great. Thanks, guys. Excellent session, Mike, Rohan, and Anuj. Great insights. So last couple of things, guys. I get a lot of calls about the membership. So if you want to become Elite CISO member, you have to be a corporate CIO or CISO. Um, if you have one, you can go to the membership page and you can fill it and team will get uh, in touch with you and onboard you. Now talking about this certificate one more time, you can come to the website, go to the events page and click on CPE certificate and then fill your uh, details on this form over here. And the password is R-A-F-A-L-E, Rafael. Okay, and this is case sensitive. Once you enter it, you will get the certificate over the email. Now the last point that everybody is waiting for. So, this is the wheel of fortune. Uh, all the members who registered, their, their name and uh, company name is over here. I will spin the wheel, it will randomly pick one person and that lucky guy will, guy or girl will win uh, Amazon Alexa. Okay, I'm going to spin it now. Okay, let's see. Great, Abhimanyu Yadav. Great, Abhimanyu, you, are you here in the uh, webinar? So you have to be in the webinar to claim your win. So type yes in the chat window if you are here. If you are not here, I will have to spin it all over again. No, because we can spoof the identity. Oh yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> it is linked to blockchain. <laughs> Great, so Abhimanyu is not here. I'm going to remove him and I'm going to spin it again. Let's see. It has to go to Delhi group, right? That's what has Pritam Gautam. I think you are attending for the first time. Type yes if you are here. If you are not here, I will spin it again. I don't think you are here, so I'm spinning it again. Because I think Pritam is here. Okay, let me see. I did not see the chat. Okay, more chat. Oh, where did the chat go? So Pritam is there, right? Okay, that's fine. Perfect. Okay, Pritam, so I will get in touch with you and uh, we will ship the Amazon Alexa to you. Thanks, guys. Bye for now. Signing off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Yeah.
अच्छा अच्छा तो ठीक है इसी रिपोर्ट में से आप डेट रखो ड्राइवर नेम रखो डिपार्टमेंट रखो व्हीकल टाइप रखो और